All right, so I have Dennis Beard and I have Dave Stanko here today. And I've known Dennis for a long time, so it's a privilege to get to have a chance to talk to you more. There are many things we could probably talk about of his work with Sarah Ventures or Open Prairie Ventures and the numerous entrepreneurs that he's assisted as an entrepreneur in residence and one of the most accomplished investors in the region who's very humble in that, but he's had successful IPOs and this is just one of the exits that he's helped to spearhead. And he's also one of the best teachers in the College of Business. If you listen to any of the students who's take, who've taken his entrepreneurial finance course, they speak wonders of how to figure out how to neg negotiate a term sheet. So we're going to hear a little bit about getting a deal done. But if you're a student and you want to learn that, take his class. It's a real honor that we have him, somebody who's been in practice that gets to train the students to think about how to do startup financing for the future. So thank you for joining us. Dennis, you can give your own version of your biography a little bit now, and then we'll move to Dave. OK, well, thank you, Laura. That was a little bit too much. but. <laughs> and don't take my class. I, I hate grading papers, so I'd really like to keep the <laughs> class size small. <laughs> uh, yeah, so uh, uh, Laura mentioned I'm with Sarah Ventures, and, and uh, we're right here in the research park, just a, almost, it would be walking distance if it weren't quite so cold today. And uh, uh, along with Tim Hare, who's here, Rob Schultz here in town, and, and uh, a partner we have out west, uh, we do early stage technology investing, not just in ag, um, but uh, we really uh, like the ag space, and uh, uh, Agrable was a, it was a great story for us. And uh, we've really enjoyed just sort of getting involved with early stage companies like Agrable and trying to help nurture them wherever we can. Uh, sometimes we don't, I don't think we don't always make a great difference, and sometimes we can help make a great difference on a company. So it's, uh, it's been a great thing. So my background is financial, but I grew up in a farm community over just south of Decatur with farmers on both sides of the family. So I worked uh, in the fields cutting weeds out of beans and uh, uh, doing all kinds of odd jobs around the farms when I was in high school and a little bit in college, uh, but uh, did not pursue an ag career. So it's kind of funny. I've always thought that would be fun. It's been, it's been nice getting back into some of the ag, uh, ag companies uh, at Sarah. And Dave, you were brought in to help Agrable because in addition to running great technology and having early customers, somebody needs to make sure that the financial house is in order and the operations are running in a productive way that makes it possible to have these types of exits really occur and a happy acquiring company that sees the potential for the future. How'd you get involved with a startup company? Tell us a little bit pre agrable of what your experience was. Sure, I'm happy to do that. Um, so my background, uh, I also, like many people actually in our company, I have a background in agriculture. We have a family farm in, in Christian County. And um, uh, at the University of Illinois here, I, I studied chemistry, and then I taught aviation, and then I en ended up doing a, an MBA here and, uh, and, and very quickly got into the VC world. So I worked in venture capital for a few years uh, and really have been part of uh, startup uh, businesses and, and high growth businesses for a number of years. So. Uh, becoming part of Agrable, it felt like a really natural fit between my VC experience and, uh, and my love of agriculture to, uh, to get involved. And it, uh, yeah, it's a lot of fun. Awesome. So what always sounds like an overnight success story isn't really just an overnight success story. It was a lot of work to get to this point. And so before we get into how the acquisition happened, which is going to be the theme for today's lunch discussion, first I'd like to take us back to the beginning. And there are some of the founders here in this room. So I see Chris. I know Tim Coolhorn's here. I don't know if Paul's here. Oh, over here. OK, great. So they have plenty of war stories, I'm sure, that they could tell you of getting started and how you make something like this take off, leave your comfy jobs, and do something completely risky. But Dennis, you were one of those early mentors that saw the potential in the beginning and then went on to become one of the first investors in the company. Take us back to the early days when you met this crew of founders that had this idea that they were going to be, as I think you told me, they said they were going to be the Amazon of ag tech. And uh, what you thought, big ideas, crazy ideas, some, some awesome, some maybe not so much from your perspective, but you had the confidence that they were going to make it. Yeah, uh, yeah it's, a, it's a really fun story back in the beginning because the three uh, founders that I think are all here today, I haven't seen Tim, but I saw Chris and Paul, um, anyway, Tim's over here. There I got go. it. Yeah, gotcha. <laughs> they, they came to meet with us. They have, there was a, a fourth, uh, Bill Northcott, who lives out east, but he's a, a U of I product as well. Uh, they came to visit us at Sarah, and we were kind of helping them frame some of their strategy. And uh, we were struck 
by how much this team had it together, how really bright they were. I mean, they, they were clearly a cut above, and, and you know, three of them were ag engineering PhDs, and, and, and all were having uh, great careers before they had this idea to get together. And one of the things we do as venture capitalists, uh, um, at Sarah, we really believe that the team is, is the most important part. I mean, everybody has, there are a lot of good ideas out there. So we sort of assume they're coming with some good ideas. And so I was doing some background checks on the team and uh, uh, talked to um, a professor friend of mine uh, who just said, these are you know, three of the smartest people you're ever gonna meet. And, I, he, and I've known this guy for a long time and I think he was absolutely right. And so we didn't know if the ideas were really good. I wasn't smart enough to figure that part out, but I figured that this team was smart enough and quick enough and good enough on their feet that they would find solutions that would work. And um, we went through, uh, uh, Laura mentioned I was fortunate enough to be involved with a couple of IPO companies earlier on, uh, including a company that came from a U of I guy. And in those hugely successful uh, businesses that built up to over a billion dollar valuation, we went through iterations on how to sell, how the product uh, model worked, uh, how to approach the customers. And we had near failure a couple times. And it's the same way here. So what you really want to be are around teams that can face those kind of big walls and make it through. So I'll, I'll, it's fun stuff. And, and I'll give a, 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 an endorsement of that these are some of the smartest people that we've ever had the chance to work with. So we saw raw potential. They also had an idea that was, it was early, and it was great to see it go from an incubator setting here at the Research Park. Enterprise Works houses about 45 companies at a time. And this was one of our fastest companies to ever exit. And they got to the point of just the incubator, not exit in terms of acquisition. They got to the point where they were took our biggest office within two years, and then they took the next office next door to that. We had to put a door between the two offices to accommodate this early stage team because everybody wanted to work with them. And they were not only attracting employees, but they were attracting a lot of interest amongst the other research park companies. So as we sit here today, startups and big corporations, this is one of those companies that worked with the other companies in the park, and that was one of the reasons I think that they were able to get some early wins. I don't know if either of you can speak a little bit to some of the early relationships you had with strategics and how that was influential in getting some market traction uh, to grow the business. Sure, I'm happy to address that. Uh, I, think, I think in general in ag tech, uh, I'm, I'm gonna borrow the phrase from, uh, from uh, one of our potential investors about um, the direct to grower graveyard. Uh, and that's a real thing, and it's something that really has to be navigated. It's a tough market when you're trying to sell to growers in a $3.50 per bushel corn market, and um, it, was, it was because of the relationships that we established with some of the larger companies that helped us get through uh, that period. So we found other ways to monetize some of the work that we were doing, establish good revenue traction with these companies, that, and we weren't necessarily dependent just on, um, on grower revenue. So, and there are a number of those companies are right here in Research Park. So I want to dive into that a little bit more, Dave. First of all, tell us why that's a graveyard and why it's problematic to based on subscriptions from what you started to hear from investors. And then let's come back to the corporate relationships. Sure. Uh, well, it's an annual sales cycle and, uh, and growers don't have any expendable income. Um, so you combine those two things and when you're looking at things like monthly revenue and comparing that against your cash burn, uh, that can be a very daunting thing to look at from a financial perspective. So. Um, Navigating that, uh, that marketplace is, is, um, is kind of challenging. Where we found our, ourselves a, um, in a position to differentiate ourselves is around sustainability. So we were able to take grower level data uh, and translate that into sustainability metrics for the supply chain and ultimately that became one of our primary sources of revenue. Great, one of the early investors was not only somebody who could put money into the company as a strategic but also help to use the product and integrate into their business, and we just heard from ADM, but they were one of those early partners. They happen to be in the same building as Agribol and Sarah Ventures, but can you tell us a little bit of how you got ADM involved and what that meant of both the investment side and the strategic partner? Sure, I'll plug my alma mater. Uh, my undergrad alma mater is from Millican University, and it was over for an alumni and MBA event there, and I ran into Greg Mills, who was uh, head of crop risk services for uh, ADM at the time, he was the president of that group, and just said to me, what's going on in the research park that I should know about? 
and just sort of off the top of my head, I thought of a couple of companies, and frankly, I can't remember who the other one was, but Agrable was one of them. <laughs> and I said, why don't you come over and visit? I'll give you a tour of uh, the Enterprise Works and the Research Park and maybe introduce you to some of the entrepreneurs. And we ended up having one of those magical tours where I didn't set anything up in advance other than I think stopping by and meeting with Chris at Agrable and, and maybe one other person, but other uh, entrepreneurs were just sort of stepping out and introducing themselves. And I think they were kind of blown away by what, what we had here. They also got a tour of NCSA's Blue Waters. And so uh, it, was a, it was a great day and uh, Greg circled back and met the rest of the Agrable team and uh, next thing you know, they're uh, negotiating to take a, a major role in the Series A preferred round. And uh, they, they always had a, a a uh, pretty active role uh, with us at Agrable in, in several different fronts. And then Greg moved on to uh, Golden Peanut Division, which became a good customer as well. And uh, Brian Young stepped up, and then uh, we started working with uh, uh, Wes Ullmeyer in the Grain Division. And it was just a good long-term relationship with them. So it was important as we talked about their success story that they had to realize who the partners would be. And although everybody assumes in many of the early stage companies we meet that they're going to sell to the farmer, the farmer or the grower is not the only part of the business of growing crops. And corn and soybeans have lots of inputs and peanuts others I'm sure that I don't know anything about in this part of the state or the country. Tell us a little bit about the potential partners that you identified because there was, in their case, crop insurance, but there were lots of different components of growing that had potential for corporate partnerships, potential for future acquisitions, and value that would help with the agronomy of the farm. Sure. We, we took um, a very critical look at our business and decided we needed to uh, really approach the market in a more strategic way. And as we looked across the value chain where we saw the most opportunity was on the digital uh, relationship between retailers who were selling inputs uh, and growers. Uh, that there really, there were some companies trying to disrupt that market in a big way. FBN is one of those examples. We felt like there was an opportunity to enhance that relationship uh, and really grow on the good work that many of those retailers are already doing with, with grower customers. Um, so we, uh, we introduced some tools into the platform to really make that connection and, and enhance the communication aspects of our software. Uh, and then we, we looked at the Crop Life 100 and said, well, let's start at the top of the list and start making some calls. And ultimately, that's what led us to uh, um, the relationship that we have with uh, Crop Production Services, which is now Nutrient Ag Solutions. But there were a number of others. And so I know, Dennis, as a mentor to the company, you were helping look with Chris and others at what are the different options to explore just as a business strategy. So getting to the retailer eventually became an important part of that. But maybe you can talk us a little bit about other types of opportunities you were exploring at that time, not from an acquisition, but from business avenue. Right. Uh, that's a great question. You've got my head spinning with that question because I think we've we discussed probably more than a dozen strategies at different times, uh, ways to work with uh, customers. Uh, you know, uh, Agrable uh, started uh, uh, a drone program, for example, and uh, you know, you've heard a lot about drones trying to come into, agri into the ag industry. Agrable came up with a pretty interesting approach, just something really simple that interfaced with the Agrable core product. And uh, we found, uh, the, uh, partly through ADM, but also talking to others, that the, that the uh, insurance adjusters for agriculture and even outside of agriculture were interested in using the drones to take images and analyze. So that was one in particular. Uh, through sustainability and related uh, sort of tracking of data in the supply chain, we were talking to quite a few different companies in that area. That was one uh, that when it came about, we realized could be, could be a really big market. That's how we, uh, we did work with, uh, gosh, Frito-Lay Pepsi, uh, General Mills, uh, AB InBev, yeah, uh, a lot of, lot of big companies there. Um, I'm trying to think of some other strategies we pursue. The guys out in the audience probably could speak to this better than I can, but it was a lot of things. One of the things we had to really work on was focusing because there were a lot of opportunities. We had powerful uh, data tools. And when you have something really powerful, it's not an exaggeration at all to say this could be the Amazon of Ag. There, there are powerful tools there. And so it's really a matter of trying to figure out where to focus and, and get the most, most benefit, create the most value. So Dave, you talked about sort of walking us through how you get to Nutrien as a potential partner. And that was a, a decision that was considered by the company of what's the right partner that's going to opt 
optimize revenue beyond what the grower brings themselves. And maybe if you could tell us a little of some of the other factors that were going into that cultural fit, the, t the location of the company, when you were doing, before you ever got into the negotiations with Nutrien, what kind of diligence were you doing on your side to think about whether this is going to be a potential good fit for you as a company, as the potential acquirer, or the company being acquired? Well, our, our initial approach was, was simply that uh, we wanted them to use our, our software and become a customer of ours. So uh, our, our conversations really started there and they, they focused there for uh, really the first several months of our approach. Um, number one, they brought scale, uh, scale like nobody, nobody else can. There are 1,500 locations in, in North America alone and 3,000 crop consultants. It's the largest ag retailer in the world. And uh, we saw it as an opportunity to take the software we had built and actually develop uh, a, a scale um, like nobody else could, could really achieve in this industry. So that was, that was the first thing. Secondly, very quickly the, in our first meeting with them, um, and again, we were approaching them as a customer, but it was clear early on that we had a very similar vision for what digital agriculture could be, um, how we can use some of the science that was built in, in the Agrable platform and ultimately use those insights to uh, create an opportunity to have a conversation ar around um, uh, better selection of inputs for growers. And um, they were building that, uh, we were building that, and, and um, uh, our strategies were just really, really well aligned. So it didn't take long for that, com for that conversation to shift from uh, being a customer to um, maybe a, a deeper relationship. Okay, now I'm going to shift to my favorite part of the story, and, and I got a little something, not from the Amazon of ag, but just the regular Amazon to help with this today. Because oh. <laughs> I learned that this deal was actually done at the Calgary Stampede, and they were instructed they better have their proper Western attire Sorry. to be able to uh, have this conversation, and that there is a methodology in Calgary of what constitutes appropriate Western wear. So I won't wear this the whole time because you're going to laugh at me, but I'm hoping that it'll tell a little bit of how you work a deal during a stampede. Dennis, Dennis wouldn't have met the dress code for that event, the I way he's dressed today. You went today. out shopping, though? <laughs> yeah. Uh, and it's funny. I actually thought this morning about sending you the picture of uh, what we called our K team. Uh, it was K for capital K knowledge because it, it was the group that was really entrenched in the deal. Uh, and, uh, and so we were defined in the document as, as individuals with knowledge. But uh, so our K team, our entire K team was there at, at the Calgary uh, Stampede, where there is a dress code, which is high Western wear. Um, I'm actually wearing the boots that, that, that I wore there that day, but it was boots and uh, a Western style shirt. And uh, I don't, Dennis, I'm sorry, I don't think you would have, you wouldn't have made the cut today. Yeah. Good ideas out there. So we sort of assume they're coming with some good ideas. And so I was doing some background checks on the team and uh, uh, talked to um, a professor friend of mine uh, who just said, these are you know, three of the smartest people you're ever going to meet. And, I, and I've known this guy for a long time, and I think he was absolutely right. And so we didn't know if the ideas were really good. I wasn't smart enough to figure that part out, but I figured that this team was smart enough and quick enough and good enough on their feet that they would find solutions that would work. And um, we went through, uh, uh, Laura mentioned I was fortunate enough to be involved with a couple of IPO companies earlier on, uh, including a company that came from a U of I guy. And in those hugely successful uh, businesses that built up to over a billion dollar valuation, we went through iterations on how to sell, how the product uh, model worked, uh, how to approach the customers. And we had near failure a couple of times. And it's the same way here. So what you really want to be are around teams that can face those kind of big walls and make it through. So I'll, I'll, it was fun stuff. And, and I'll give a, 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 an endorsement of that these are some of the smartest people that we've ever had the chance to work with. So we saw raw potential. They also had an idea that was, it was early, and it was great to see it go from an incubator setting here at the Research Park. Enterprise Works houses about 45 companies at a time. And this was one of our fastest companies to ever exit. And they got to the point of just the incubator, not exit in terms of acquisition. They got to the point where they were took our biggest office within two years, and then they took the next office next door to that. We had to put a door between the two offices to accommodate this early stage team 
because everybody wanted to work with them. And they were not only attracting employees, but they were attracting a lot of interest amongst the other research park companies. So as we sit here today, startups and big corporations, this is one of those companies that worked with the other companies in the park. And that was one of the reasons I think that they were able to get some early wins. I don't know if either of you can speak a little bit to some of the early relationships you had with strategics and how that was influential in getting some market traction uh, to grow the business. Sure, I'm happy to address that. Uh, I, think, I think in general in ag tech, uh, I'm, I'm going to borrow the phrase from, uh, from uh, one of our potential investors about um, the direct-to-grower graveyard. Uh, and that's a real thing, and it's something that really has to be navigated. It's a tough market when you're trying to sell to growers in a $3.50 per bushel corn market. And um, it, was, it was because of the relationships that we established with some of the larger companies that helped us get through uh, that period. So we found other ways to monetize some of the work that we were doing, establish good revenue traction with these companies, that, and we weren't necessarily dependent just on, um, on grower revenue. So, and there are a number of those companies are right here in Research Park. So I want to dive into that a little bit more, Dave. First of all, tell us why that's a graveyard and why it's problematic to based on subscriptions from what you started to hear from investors. And then let's come back to the corporate relationships. Sure. Uh, well, it's an annual sales cycle and, uh, and growers don't have any expendable income. Um, so you combine those two things and when you're looking at things like monthly revenue and comparing that against your cash burn, uh, that can be a very daunting thing to look at from a financial perspective. So. Um, Navigating that, uh, that marketplace is, is, um, is kind of challenging. Where we found our, ourselves a, um, in a position to differentiate ourselves is around sustainability. So we were able to take grower level data uh, and translate that into sustainability metrics for the supply chain and ultimately that became one of our primary sources of revenue. Great, one of the early investors was not only somebody who could put money into the company as a strategic but also help to use the product and integrate into their business, and we just heard from ADM, but they were one of those early partners. They happen to be in the same building as Agribol and Sarah Ventures, but can you tell us a little bit of how you got ADM involved and what that meant of both the investment side and the strategic partner? Sure, I'll plug my alma mater. Uh, my undergrad alma mater is from Millican University, and it was over for an alumni and MBA event there, and I ran into Greg Mills, who was uh, head of crop risk services for uh, ADM at the time, he was the president of that group, and just said to me, what's going on in the research park that I should know about? And just sort of off the top of my head, I thought of a couple of companies, and frankly, I can't remember who the other one was, but Agrivol was one of them. <laughs> and I said, why don't you come over and visit? I'll give you a tour of uh, the Enterprise Works and the research park, and maybe introduce you to some of the entrepreneurs. And we ended up having one of those magical tours where I didn't set anything up in advance other than, I think, stopping by and meeting with Chris at Agribol and, and maybe one other person, but other uh, entrepreneurs were just sort of stepping out and introducing themselves. And I think they were kind of blown away by what, what we had here. They also got a tour of NCSA's Blue Waters. And so uh, it, was a, it was a great day and uh, Greg circled back and met the rest of the Agribol team. And uh, next thing you know, they're uh, negotiating to take a, a major role in the Series A preferred round. And uh, they, they always had a, a a uh, pretty active role uh, with us at Agribol in, in several different fronts. And then Greg moved on to uh, Golden Peanut Division, which became a good customer as well. And uh, Brian Young stepped up, and then uh, we started working with uh, uh, Wes Ullmeyer in the Grain Division. And it was just a good long-term relationship with them. So it was important as we talked about their success story that they had to realize who the partners would be. And although everybody assumes in many of the early stage companies we meet that they're going to sell to the farmer, the farmer or the grower is not the only part of the business of growing crops. And corn and soybeans have lots of inputs and peanuts others I'm sure that I don't know anything about in this part of the state or the country. Tell us a little bit about the potential partners that you identified because there was, in their case, crop insurance, but there were lots of different components of growing that had potential for corporate partnerships, potential for future acquisitions, and value that would help with the agronomy of the farm. Sure, we, we took um, a very critical look at our business and decided we needed to uh, really approach the market in a more strategic way. And as we looked across the value chain where we saw the most opportunity was on the digital uh, relationship between retailers who were selling inputs uh, and growers. Uh, that there really, there were 
some companies trying to disrupt that market in a big way. FBN is one of those examples. We felt like there was an opportunity to enhance that relationship uh, and really grow on the good work that many of those retailers are already doing with, with grower customers. Um, so we, uh, we introduced some tools into the platform to really make that connection and, and enhance the communication aspects of our software. Uh, and then we, we looked at the Crop Life 100 and said, well, let's start at the top of the list and start making some calls. And ultimately, that's what led us to uh, um, the relationship that we have with uh, Crop Production Services, which is now Nutrient Ag Solutions. But there were a number of others. And so I know, Dennis, as a mentor to the company, you were helping look with Chris and others at what are the different options to explore just as a business strategy. So getting to the retailer eventually became an important part of that. But maybe you can talk us a little bit about other types of opportunities you were exploring at that time, not from an acquisition, but from business avenue. Right. Uh, that's a great question. You've got my head spinning with that question because I think we've we discussed probably more than a dozen strategies at different times, uh, ways to work with uh, customers. Uh, you know, uh, Agrable uh, started uh, uh, a drone program, for example, and uh, you know, you've heard a lot about drones trying to come into, agri into the ag industry. Agrable came up with a pretty interesting approach, just something really simple that interfaced with the Agrable core product. And uh, we found, uh, the, uh, partly through ADM, but also talking to others, that the, that the uh, insurance adjusters for agriculture and even outside of agriculture were interested in using the drones to take images and analyze. So that was one in particular. Uh, through sustainability and related uh, sort of tracking of data in the supply chain, we were talking to quite a few different companies in that area. That was one uh, that when it came about, we realized could be, could be a really big market. That's how we, uh, we did work with, uh, gosh, Frito-Lay Pepsi, uh, General Mills, uh, AB InBev, yeah, uh, a lot of, lot of big companies there. Um, I'm trying to think of some other strategies we pursue. The guys out in the audience probably could speak to this better than I can, but it was a lot of things. One of the things we had to really work on was focusing because there were a lot of opportunities. We had powerful uh, data tools. And when you have something really powerful, it's not an exaggeration at all to say this could be the Amazon of Ag. There, there are powerful tools there. And so it's really a matter of trying to figure out where to focus and, and get the most, most benefit, create the most value. So Dave, you talked about sort of walking us through how you get to Nutrien as a potential partner. And that was a, a decision that was considered by the company of what's the right partner that's going to op optimize revenue beyond what the grower brings themselves. And maybe if you could tell us a little of some of the other factors that were going into that cultural fit, the, t the location of the company, when you were doing, before you ever got into the negotiations with Nutrien, what kind of diligence were you doing on your side to think about whether this is going to be a potential good fit for you as a company, as the potential acquirer, or the company being acquired? Well, our, our initial approach was, was simply that uh, we wanted them to use our, our software and become a customer of ours. So, uh, our, our conversations really started there and they, they focused there for uh, really the first several months of our approach. Um, number one, they brought scale, uh, scale like nobody, nobody else can. There are 1,500 locations in, in North America alone and 3,000 crop consultants. It's the largest ag retailer in the world. And uh, we saw it as an opportunity to take the software we had built and actually develop uh, a, a scale um, like nobody else could, could really achieve in this industry. So that was, that was the first thing. Secondly, very quickly the, in our first meeting with them, um, and again, we were approaching them as a customer, but it was clear early on that we had a very similar vision for what digital agriculture could be, um, how we can use some of the science that was built in, in the Agrable platform and ultimately use those insights to uh, create an opportunity to have a conversation ar around um, uh, better selection of inputs for growers. And um, they were building that, uh, we were building that, and, and um, uh, our strategies were just really, really well aligned. So it didn't take long for that, com for that conversation to shift from uh, being a customer to um, maybe a, a deeper relationship. Okay, now I'm going to shift to my favorite part of the story, and, and I got a little something, not from the Amazon of Ag, but just the regular Amazon to help with this today. Because... Oh. I learned that this deal was actually done at the Calgary Stampede, and they were instructed they better have their proper Western attire. Sorry. 
to be able to uh, have this conversation and that there is a methodology in Calgary of what constitutes appropriate Western wear. So I won't wear this the whole time because you're going to laugh at me, but I'm hoping that it'll tell a little bit of how you work a deal during a stampede. Dennis, Dennis wouldn't have met the dress code for that event, the I way he's dressed today. You went today. out shopping, though? <laughs> yeah. Uh, and it's funny. I actually thought this morning about sending you the picture of uh, what we called our K team. Uh, it was K for capital K knowledge because it, it was the group that was really entrenched in the deal. Uh, and, uh, and so we were defined in the document as, as individuals with knowledge. But uh, so our K team, our entire K team was there at, at the Calgary uh, Stampede, where there is a dress code, which is high Western wear. Um, I'm actually wearing the boots that, that, that I wore there that day, but it was boots and uh, a Western style shirt. And uh, I don't, Dennis, I'm sorry, I don't think you would have, you wouldn't have made the cut today. Yeah. No boots, huh? <laughs> yeah, so, you know, if uh, Nutrient's headquartered, uh, a little background on Nutrient, they were a merger of Agrium and uh, Potash Corporation, both Canadian companies, and they emerged a year ago this past January. And uh, they have dual headquarters in Saskatoon and Calgary, and we were working with the Calgary office, which is where the head of strategy is, and also the CEO. So we had a couple of meetings up there, and they, they strategically timed the second meeting to be during the Calgary Stampede, which is one of the largest radio, rodeos. I think they draw I don't know, over a million people in the 10, yeah, in the ten days of the event. And they use it as, uh, they're, they're one of the major sponsors of the event, and they have skyboxes and uh, VIP areas, and, and, uh, but they said, you've got to dress Western or you won't be allowed. And they told the story about their CFO not being allowed in wearing his you know, fancy designer sport coat, but it wasn't Western. So uh, we were all coached on what to wear, and uh, it was kind of fun. And we really did uh, negotiate the final terms. We got over the last few terms of the, uh, of the agreement uh, on that trip. Well, I tip my hat. You got the deal done <laughs> at the Stampede and learned a little bit more about rodeo and western wear. Um, they came to visit, and so this was another thing that we enjoyed hearing about was when a company comes and they're starting to do due diligence, what are they looking for? And uh, I hope you're sincere in this and that you'd said, they were looking around at the rest of the companies that are here, and what kind of environment are you in? And maybe you can share some of their thoughts about the other agriculture companies that are in our midst. Well, uh, they, first of all, uh, they made arrangements to, to show up here one day, and they, I don't know how many people they brought, Dave, maybe eight, eight or ten people, and they all flew in on the corporate jet. And, you know, my mind's spinning about what that cost was, and I thought, you know, they're not here to talk about a minor sales contract if, if they're making that kind of an effort. And uh, we welcomed them in the Agribol offices, and during the break, I was speaking with Mark Thompson, who's head of strategy, and he was asking questions about the other companies. He'd already spotted the signs around the research park. Uh, who's here? What do they do here? What does this company do? ADM's in your building. What's ADM doing? And uh, this John Deere Research Center, what kind of work are they doing? And, and the conversation went on. He was clearly captivated by that. And I was asking him about what kind of uh, research uh, funding they have, where they place their investments, and they, they do some venture investing, they do some direct investing into companies. But it became clear that uh, uh, they were unaware of what we have going on here, and we're very intrigued by that. I don't know if you have anything to add to that, because you had some conversations as well. Uh, yeah, lots of conversations. Um, I, I think uh, our, our initial approach was, was to uh, talk about the quality of our team. And it really can't be uh, said enough what a talented group of people we had assembled uh, at our office right here in Champaign. The other side of that is how we can continue to uh, expand that pipeline of talent coming right here out of the University of Illinois. So that was a big part of our approach uh, when we were talking about who we are as a company. Not only do we, do we have uh, an incredible staff now, but we, we have a, uh, the ability to continue to expand that staff. During this process, you have to keep quiet on a lot of it because it's not done until it's done. Tell us about working with your existing team, which was a big team at this time, of going through this process and how you manage that. Dave, I know you were responsible for keeping your mouth shut when you needed to, but also still being able to keep the deal moving forward. What's that like? It's the worst. Um... So I, I, as a leader, I feel like transparency and honesty is probably the most important quality you can bring to uh, a team. And it was one of the things I was not able to provide through the entire process. And so that, that personally made it, made it somewhat difficult. 
I was so thankful the day that we finally announced the deal that we could, we could talk openly about why we were spending so much time in Loveland, Colorado and, uh, and in Calgary and we had multiple office visits coming to, to, coming to visit us. We were in this really intense due diligence process where uh, Tim and Paul and Brent and I were, we spent countless hours out of the office working off site trying to keep a, a tight lid on things and uh, we were finally able to be honest about what we'd been working on. Um, but that was, uh, that was one of the more difficult parts. Yeah, and I, I would add, I was probably the point person for the shareholders, and uh, at, at one point we kind of had to have a conversation that we need to start talking to our shareholders. Uh, we needed to kind of keep it quiet, and early on uh, through the negotiations, um, you know, it really wasn't clear how it was going to work out. Whether we would do anything, I thought we would, but how it would take shape. And then at one point, all of a sudden, uh, the light bulb went on and thought, we better start getting our shareholders involved. So I called the top you know, three or four uh, shareholders and started getting them uh, up to speed. And uh, then it happened pretty quickly after that. And you had a lot of owners. Can you tell us a little bit about the cap table of what it looked like at this point? Yeah, I, I think I can talk about that. So we, we, uh, one of the interesting things, but it's a complicating factor with Agrable, is it was actually started by a, a pretty large group of people. A lot of times when we back a startup company, it's maybe a couple of people, a couple of technical people. But I, I mentioned the sort of the four key founders, but there, were, there was another group of about four more that were very engaged and were really, really essentially co-founders. And uh, Agrable had merged in another company with a couple of co-founders of that group in. So it expanded that group. So we had some co-founders, and some of whom we really weren't in a position to share information with early on. Um, and uh, they, they form a sort of a base class. They own common stock, and, and most of them also invested in preferred stock as the company grew. And then uh, we had a group of employees that all had stock options. Some of those options had been exercised, so they were common stockholders. Then we did a big Series A round uh, that was led by Flyover Capital, and, and Tim, uh, Tim's here, Tim Foote, he was up on the podium earlier. Flyover Capital out of Kansas City. Uh, uh, came in along with ADM and a few other investors, and then we did a B round led by Maumee Ventures, which is uh, the venture division of the Andersons out of uh, the Toledo, Ohio area. And, uh, and, and so we had all these sort of complex uh, groups of people that came in at various stages. Uh, in addition to those ones that I named, we had quite a collection. We had a lot of support from the community. Uh, we had quite a few angel investors from right around the Champaign area, but also some from far away, including South America. So uh, we had all these people that maybe had different levels of investment, different priorities and preferences as to what their stock was to earn and how they were going to be paid out. Thankfully, it was a nice enough deal that uh, you know, everybody did okay on this. Everybody did well. So you're serving as interim CEO at this period of time, I think. Yeah. Uh, and that was just, you know, just really just kind of shareholder relations and, and uh, uh, you know, ki kind of coordinating the high-level stuff. I get, I, I'm not very good at this, but I kind of got coerced into being the bad cop a couple of times with Nutri, and so I was sort of the last call uh, on, on several occasions. In the end, we had a great relationship, uh, and I, I really enjoyed working with that team. I felt very good about the Nutri, and I know you may be asking a question about that, but the, we sort of felt that, that we were clicking and that they were, uh, they were good managers. Okay. So all those investors means there are different opinions of whether to exit early or later. And we had some discussion of that. Dave, you'd done quite a bit of financial analysis, I think, to get to a conclusion where there was the right timing. Share more of what kind of thought process goes through now versus later, taking more money versus not taking more money. Uh, sure, That's, um, we were in the middle of our B round. We had, just, we had just done an initial closing when uh, these conversations started, and so it was a really awkward time for us. We were negotiating uh, additional investments from new investors and current investors on our cap table uh, while also trying to negotiate a, an exit. And so keeping the company financially afloat was somewhat challenging during that period. I will say uh, having supportive investors and really like Dennis and, and Sarah, uh, and flyover as well. Uh, you can't get through that process if you don't have an investor on your cap table that's willing to uh, keep you supported through that process. So uh, they were both amazing. And if any of you are looking for capital and you're lucky enough to get these guys uh, on your cap table, you should take them in a second because they're, they're fantastic. Um, but we, we took the, the numbers that were in front of us and we really compared that against 
uh, what would this look like if we finished the B round, and then if we went on to a C round, what there are the equivalent exit points and values that would achieve the same returns for our current investors. And um, surprisingly, uh, it doesn't take long for you to get yourself into a spot where you need a $500 million exit in order to achieve a similar result. And so we, we looked at that analysis, we looked at the number of companies that are really out there that are able to write a $500 million check, and um, ultimately the, I think the decision was clear for, uh, for us as a management team, but also for um, our shareholders. Which became one of the biggest software exits to date at that point in ag tech software, so this was a good opportunity um, for, for certainly press around it, but making a difference in something that may not have been there if you waited, I suppose. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. Okay, so you get acquired by Nutrien, and now you are Nutrien here in Champaign. What's that been like as you transition and are now part of a much larger corporation? Uh, it's, it's really been great. Um, there, that's not without some challenges of, of being the nimble 50-person company, and now we're part of a company that has 20,000 employees. So there are many new processes that we're learning, uh, getting your mileage reimbursed, for example. That takes about six weeks now, as opposed to <laughs> uh, you know, a few minutes. Um, so those are the types of things that we're working through. But as a whole, um, we've, we've basically tripled our team size. We went from about 50 employees here. Uh, we've, we're now paired up with another 100 or so in Loveland, Colorado. And so our technical capabilities are just that much stronger. In addition, we now have the network of uh, over half a million growers here in the United States. And it's allowed us to take some of the work we're doing in sustainability, particularly around uh, downstream analytics, but also around having an impact on sustainable agriculture, and allowed us to scale that up in a huge way. And that's, uh, that's been the really exciting work that, uh, that I and a lot of the team members here in Champaign have been working on lately. So noteworthy like this, exit was means others are coming to you. Dennis, you've said since the Agribol exit, now you're one of the experts on ag tech. As an investor, what does this mean for you of having this exit? Yeah, I, it, it's, it's kind of funny because I'm no more expert than I was a couple of years ago, which is probably not a lot, but uh, it's noteworthy and it made the news. And, uh, you know, at Sarah, we owe a lot to, to the Agribol team, uh, founders, and all the employees for making a, success, a successful effort. And since we led early on, we probably get a disproportionate uh, share of the praise uh, for helping that. But as a result, two good things happened for our firm. And hopefully this will translate into good things for other companies in the future. One is we have more investors that are interested in investing with us. Uh, so we're, uh, we, we have since raised a third fund and, and, a, and are in, uh, touching, uh, finishing off a sidecar to that third fund. Uh, so if anybody wants to invest, come see me. I don't know if I can say that, but I just did. Uh, SEC violation. Yeah, yeah. Uh, SE what? And, 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 uh, and then also uh, we've had a really nice stream of companies in the ag tech space now call and see if we would like to look at their company. And it, you know, there's a lot of value in having a stream of deals coming your way. And so, uh, I don't know, I, I should have looked this up before I came over here. We, we have a data system that tracks the different industries that we get, but we get a pretty steady flow of ag tech deals, and I think Agribol has a lot to do with that. So, we're blessed to have that and just feel uh, really good. Uh, you know, the, the other thing, uh, you know, I just think we, we made a difference uh, to a lot of people in that Agribol group. Uh, the employees, all those stock options that were out there, the founders, and, uh, and I, I'm not saying we, just Sarah alone, but uh, this whole team, I mean, we, we really brought something to Champaign-Urbana and this community, and I think we should be really proud of it, and I want to do it again. I think we're out of time. I don't know if there's a last question somebody wants to ask. Feel free. We haven't had a lot of questions today. So I may take this as just an opportunity to say congratulations to everybody on the Agribol team that's in this room. There are a lot of you we've gotten to know over the years, and now as Nutrien, we're thrilled to have you continue to grow here in the Research Park and in Champaign-Urbana. And congrats to Sarah Ventures of finding this company, making an investment, and making us on the map for these types of things for the future, too. So thank Thanks. you both, Dave and thank you. Dennis. Thank you.